Jeremiah 29, 11, gives us that amazing assurance of God's good thoughts concerning our lives that gives us hope no matter what it is that life may throw at us. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. He is God, the monarch of the universe telling you, hey there, I am on your side and I've got this, trust me. These are points to note in the understanding of God's plan for everything. Here is what this understanding proves. First, it proves that God is almighty and can do as he wills with us, in us, and for us. Secondly, it proves that he not only can, he is willing to do it. Thirdly, his intentions are good and pure. I know there are usually some fears when it comes to trusting God's plan for you sometimes. Maybe you are like, what if trusting God is a mistake? What if he's not there the way I want him to be? What if my faith messes everything up for me? These are the fears that make you say you trust God, yet you have alternative options for the just-in-case moments. Just in case God doesn't show up in time. Just in case God doesn't give me what I want. Just in case God fails entirely. However, this is not how faith works. This is not the faith that works. To trust God is to trust God like you trust the air you breathe, the sun to shine, the plane to fly, and so on. Trusting God's plan is believing that he is able to do what he has promised to do for you in the best way and in the best time. About the integrity of God's plan, here is how the Bible puts it in Isaiah 14, verse 24. The Lord Almighty has sworn, surely as I have planned, so it will be, and as I have purposed, so it will happen. Know what each phrase is saying here. The plan is rock solid. The plan is real. The plan is powerful, just like the speaker is. Remember, I told you before that the integrity of a word is in the integrity of the speaker. If a rich man gives you his word, you'd believe it more than the word of a poor person because the rich guy has the resources to back up what he said. Likewise, the integrity of God's word and plans is the same as the integrity of God himself. Hear what God said to confirm this. Psalms 138 verse 2. I will bow down toward your holy temple and will praise your name for your unfailing love and your faithfulness. For you have so exalted your solemn decree that it surpasses your fame. The King James Version puts it this way. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. When he prepares it, he stands by it. God doesn't care more what you think about him than he wants you to think about his word. This is because he wants you to trust his integrity. And when it comes to integrity, a person's word matters more than what they call themselves. God's plan also works the same way. The thing about God's plan is that it is purpose specific than people specific. This means that the thing God wants to do is more about why he wants to do it than the element through which he intends to do it. This also means that the failure of a person doesn't mean the failure of God's plan. Let me give you an example from the Bible. Follow me as I show you this important truth today that will change your mindset about God's purpose forever. Take a good look at the life of Adam and Eve. What was God's plan for them from the beginning? How do you tell what God has in mind for them at creation? Can we find this in the Bible? Yes, we can. Let me show you. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image and our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. If you do look carefully, you'd see it all written there. Man was made out of God. He was God's family. 
he mattered to God. God had direct contact with him and wanted his mark felt on earth today. Therefore, God gave man the complete rule and rulership of his creation. The plan was to have a creation with whom he could fellowship and call family an earth that could be a place of activity and home for them and a rendezvous point for him and his creation, where he could do his will and bask in the worship of his prized possession, man. However, this plan faced a challenge when the devil made Adam and Eve to sin against God by eating the forbidden fruit. They were removed from the holy garden of God in Eden, and in their lives that plan was in a sense destroyed. But you see, my friend, that plan didn't die. It wasn't destroyed. Nothing can destroy God's plan. No devil in history can destroy it. No mistake of man can destroy it. It may be delayed, pushed forward and all, but it will come to pass. That's why I said before, it is purpose specific than people specific. Meaning, if the initial vessel through a plan was to fail, they are replaced by someone else who would be able to carry it out. Today, in the lives of every child of God, that plan of God united with his prized possession is existing and living on in a spiritual sense. And when that Christian leaves this world in death, that plan would be consummated for eternity. See how Romans chapter 5, 17 through 19 says it. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as though the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Also, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 through 13. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit. What Adam and Eve failed to establish, Jesus filled up and established it for all humanity to enter through faith in his atonement. Though they destroyed what God planned for all people in their own lives, the plan still came to pass. Therefore, if you are asking, can I destroy God's plan? The answer would be no. But if you are asking, can I destroy God's plan for my life? The answer would be yes. What does it mean to destroy God's plan? It means to render it invalid and non-existent. It means to shut it down and erase it from being. This is not possible because the plans and purposes of God can be altered only by God himself and by no one else. But can you alter or render that plan invalid in your own life? Yes, you can. How? By displacing yourself like Adam and Eve through certain activities that contradict the very standards of God for you that suits his plans for your life. What are the ways you can destroy God's plan for your life? First, through disobedience. Disobedience sets you up as independent before God. It tells God you aren't subject to him. It tells God that he can't tell you what to do. And the thing about the plan of God, it flows through his preeminence. Whether there is a Pharaoh there or not, there must be a Moses who God has influenced over to be the major player in the master plan. Disobedience rejects the counsel of God for you. And if you walk in your own way, you cannot get the outcome of those who walk in God's. You know the outcome for Adam and Eve when they disobeyed. Secondly, unbelief in God or lack of faith has the potential to destroy the plan of God for a person's life. A perfect example would be the children of Israel in the wilderness. What do you think the plan of God for them was when they were brought out of Egypt? Of course, to take them into the promised land safely. 
He even led them through a longer route because he didn't want them to encounter wars that could discourage them on their journey. You see what the Bible says about them in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 16 through 19. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Just like disobedience, unbelief tells God that he cannot do what he says he would do. It denies his deity. It denies his power. It denies everything God stands for, and it sadly, it displaces us from the plan. Why? Because in order for that plan to come to pass in your life, you have to believe in the initiator, God himself. These two things have a direct influence over any other reason that may hinder God's plan from coming to pass in your life, whether they are wrong associations, giving up, sin, and so on. Therefore, what should you do to bring God's plan to bear in your life? Believe and walk in obedience. It takes believing to walk side by side with God. It takes believing and obedience to work with Him. And if you will be willing and obedient to His words, living for Him, David says in the Psalms, you shall eat the good of the land. Job also says that you shall spend your days in prosperity and your years in pleasure. You will find true rest in this life and in the next only when you are in the center of the will of God. Remember, all you have to do is believe and obey. For everyone experiencing a storm in life, the symbolism of Jesus calming the storm should provide you immense encouragement and hope. Jesus and his apostles boarded a boat to the opposite bank of the Sea of Galilee after preaching to big crowds at the Sea of Galilee. A storm hit them as they crossed the sea with gusts so strong that the apostles believed they'd perish. The apostles raced to wake Jesus, who was sleeping below deck during the storm, and asked why he didn't seem to mind. When Jesus awoke, he instructed the storm to just be quiet and the winds instantly ceased. Storms are both permitted by God and we are delivered by Him so that we might experience His protection more vividly. God will deliver you from the midst of the storm you are currently facing and doesn't matter how strong or big it is. Have faith in Him. He loves you and He will save you. Life is a lot like unexpected storms. We're doing okay until all of a sudden, boom. Storms, on the other hand, do not continue indefinitely. Winds blow away material that might otherwise accumulate in trees. The rain drenches the blossoms and washes everything clean. Our spirits, they're the same way. What if, instead of focusing on the negative aspects of life's storms, we searched for the positive aspects? Storms have the ability to empower us, they purify our spirits. They have the ability to remove debris or anything that does not need to be in our life. Storms are excellent reminders that even when you're being battered, you may rest assured that God will be with you through every adversity. The God who created the storm has the power to soothe it, and he will be with you until the storms pass. I've lately heard bad stories, Perhaps you have as well. My livelihood was taken away from me. I've officially become a homeless person. I'm completely exhausted. I was told I have stage three cancer. My son is autistic along with many other stories. These are the storms that both you and I fear. When it rains in my life, I like to remember Noah's narrative, Genesis 6 through 9, 17. He was familiar with the storm that annihilated everything. Noah's narrative serves as a great motivation for us since he had no choice but to rely on God for his very life. Noah's faith is what most strikes me about him. When we're going through a rough patch, it's tempting to think of our religion merely as an internal anchor. Noah, on the other hand, was not one of them. He trusted God even when others laughed and mocked him. Do not be anxious about anything 
but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, verses 6 through 7. God loves hearing our gratitude and praise. Whether we've made it safely through the storm or we're still in it, when you are in the deepest of the storm, remember to pray because that is when you need Him the most. This notion was well understood by Paul, who had been beaten, shipwrecked, and imprisoned. That's why Jesus consistently urges us to pray to God in thankfulness. Philippians 4 verse 6. This serves to remind us of God's goodness and to reinforce our faith. Small steps begin and conclude large accomplishments. The huge ark was constructed one chiseled piece of wood at a time. Every day when we are faithful in modest ways, we are allowing God to achieve something amazing that we cannot. To see our predicament though, we must take the concrete steps that only we can take. Sometimes we wish for a miracle, but it never comes. But every now and again, we wish for a miracle and it comes true. I recently spoke with my neighbor whose spouse has been declared cancer free. We had cried together as we prayed for him. He successfully completed a diagnostic test and his recuperation really nothing short of phenomenal. Start by removing your doubts about God. Allow him to work by opening the door. When he did, Noah was prepared to put his life on the line. The ark was built panel by panel, nail by nail. That translates to God will see us via prayer by prayer, affirmation by affirmation. His presence and optimism will never leave you. The sun will shine again. The tunnel has a light at the end of it. You shall be guided to the other side by God. You shall be guided through by His grace. I reside in Mississippi, where we experience a variety of storms. We occasionally have afternoon sun showers, evening thunderstorms, and hurricanes. Storms come in many shapes and sizes in life. There are sun shower storms that come and vanish as soon as they arrived. Then there are thunderstorms that come in, blowing wind, crashing lightning, and knocking out your electricity for a while. Then there are stormy seasons in life. There are times when instead of dealing with one storm and moving on, you have an entire season of a storm after storm in your life, and you're left wondering when the season will end and the storms will stop. Similar to a hurricane season when it seems you finally get past one storm and the next one is brewing and headed your way. Jesus reminds us in Matthew chapter 7 verses 24 through 25 that anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against the house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. Do you find yourself in the midst of a sudden dramatic outpouring of difficulties and tribulations in your life? Do they seem to be on your side today? My friend, hold true to the foundation of Jesus and his message. He is our rock and no storm can shake us. Life's storms don't imply Jesus doesn't care about you or doesn't listen to your prayers. On the contrary, he predicted that you will face difficulties in this world. If you're going through a difficult time, remember that Jesus has triumphed over the world. What exactly does that even imply? It signifies to me that this storm has a purpose. This season of tribulations and difficulties has a purpose. That purpose may not be obvious right now or even tomorrow, but God never wastes a hardship, a tribulation, or a storm. He can, on the other hand, utilize them to fulfill his bigger purpose in your life. King David, who was a man after God's own heart, wrote many psalms of heart-wrenching protest and lament about his circumstances and his enemies. Psalm 142, verses 1 and 2. With my voice I cry out to the Lord. With my voice I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. Why is this storm in my life right now? I encourage you to question the Lord honestly 
What is the source of all these storms in my life? Why have I been plagued by storms for such a long time? What exactly are you attempting to demonstrate to me? Lord, please let me see it. It's okay to inquire of the Lord as to why. In the Psalms, David asks the Lord why. He also informed God how he truly felt about the storms in his life, as well as his frustration with how long it took the Lord to react. Tell God how you're feeling. There isn't a single verse in the Bible that states that you can't tell God how you're feeling about what you're going through. He wants you to converse with him as if you were conversing with a friend. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Isaiah 43, verse 2. The Lord sees you right now, just as you are. He sees your pain, your brokenness, and the onslaught of storms that have befallen you in life. There isn't a single raindrop, wind gust, or water puddle that He is not aware of. He is not shocked at all by how difficult this has been for you or how much it has shaken your life. Every grief, thought, and uncertainty is known to him. He doesn't expect you to keep it all together, to stay strong, to figure it out on your own, to do everything right the first time, and to pass the test, trial, or storm with flying colors. He is aware of your existence. When he formed you, and before the storms in your life began, he knew your weaknesses, your imperfections, shortcomings, and every small detail about you. He still has love for you. He adores you to bits. He understands how terrible life is for you, and he expects you to crumble under the weight of it all. It's fine to crumble. It's fine not to be fine. Lean into the foundation of Jesus and his love when life's storms don't go away and tell him precisely how you feel and what you need. We have a terrific high priest who can empathize with our frailty. He understands. He too was a human being. He understands how difficult life can be. Persecution, disease, death, relationship problems, financial difficulties, career storms, loss, sadness, and agony are all things he has experienced. And he's not telling you to keep your cool and appear as if nothing's wrong. In the face of hardship, God has always saved, even prospered his people. He'll save you from the raging storm. In the midst of death and destruction, the 91st Psalm is a powerful song of protection. The epidemic may fall by the hundreds of tens of thousands, but the plague will not get near your tent. Psalms 91 verse 10. When you're under his shelter, a storm is little more than a blast of wind. You're invincible. In a hurricane, he feels completely at ease. Storms, after all, are a natural aspect of God's creation. What's the storm in your life that you don't think there's a way out of? Turn to Jesus. Just turn to Jesus and cry out to God for aid, as the disciples did. Keep going until he wakes up and hears your pleading. He will come to your rescue and calm that storm in your life if you trust him. Have you ever experienced a difficult phase of having to wait in your life, where all you want is answers, yet feel absolutely clueless? Waiting months, even years, to see how God will act in a situation may be quite tough. Because I'm the sort of person who loves to get things done fast, waiting has always been difficult for me. I'm happiest when I'm working on anything and it works out as planned. However, I am a firm believer that God helps us grow by guiding us through the most challenging circumstances. I also believe that God hears our prayers and will respond at the proper time. It's time for you to wait on God until He answers. Your appointed time of favor has come. He is going to answer your prayers. I'm sharing this with you because I believe you're going through something similar. Perhaps you've been waiting months or years for a response to an unanswered prayer. It might be causing you grief or despair that you carry with you on a regular basis. Perhaps you've been treated unfairly 
and have been hoping for God to intervene on your behalf. Perhaps a member of your family has been unwell for some time and your prayer for God's healing has gone unanswered and you're afraid you'll lose them. Perhaps you lost your job and have been praying for months because you're still unemployed. I'd want to remind you that God has placed you in this period for a reason. God has his reasons to make you wait. Have you listened to some? God wants you to wait for strength. Isaiah 40, 31 says, But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. God wants you to wait for his will to be accomplished. Hebrews 10, 36 says, You need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. Waiting renews our faith and strengthens our faith in Him. Psalm 33, 20-22 says, We wait and hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In Him our hearts rejoice. For we trust in His holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in You. You can communicate to God and tell Him your concerns and wants while you wait. He desires for you to convey your troubles and burdens to Him. It's important to talk to God and tell Him how you're feeling. Of course, He already knows, but He desires a relationship with you and desires for you to come to Him with your needs. While you wait, study God's Word in the Bible. The Scriptures give us the truth, but Satan and our own self feed us lies that will discourage us while we wait. Finally, as Jesus advises in Matthew 34, we must wait without anxiety. Anxiety means that you pray, but yet you start doubting whether that prayer request is going to be granted. Quit doubting God and give Him time to work on your request. He will grant it because, unlike men, God never fails. Always take inspiration from God's servants who waited and eventually reaped the benefits of God's favors. Jacob waited 14 years and put in a lot of effort for Rachel to accept him as his wife. After God commanded him to construct a massive ark and people mocked him for it, Noah waited for the rain to fall. Sarah waited until she was in her 80s to have her first child. Job was devastated when his entire family died and he lost everything he owned. Despite this, he never lost faith in God and waited for God to respond to his pleas and prayers. We learn from these servants and many more others that when God has heard your prayers and has promised to answer, nothing and no one will stand in his way. It doesn't matter how difficult the situation looks, he will answer. God is going to uplift you from the abyss that you find yourself in at the moment. Life's situation looks difficult only in the eyes of men, not God. You serve an omnipotent God. He has never changed. He has never stopped loving you. He has loved you even when you least deserved it. He has blessed you continually, even when you've taken him for granted. He has forgiven, even when you've sinned knowingly. He provided his own son to die for your sins. I get emotional when I think about how much God has loved us. Words will never be enough to quantify. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Isaiah 40, 31. Having to wait on God after your prayers have gone unanswered is one of the most difficult situations to be in. There are moments when we pray with all our might, knowing that we really need God to intercede, yet nothing happens. There's no change. Nevertheless, the need may become much greater it's easy to pray and wait with tremendous anticipation for God to respond, large and boldly at first. However, when the days, weeks, months, and years pass, we may begin to question if God is really listening. We might become tired of praying when weeks and months pass without a clear answer. We start praying less earnestly and seldom. This has always been human nature. And I'm here to remind you to be a greater Christian than the typical. Continue to pray and wait for an answer. Your appointed time of favor is coming. We wait for God to deliver, answer our prayers, refresh our power, to accomplish what only God can do. Because He is God and we are not, 
we wait for Him. We are changed and strengthened as we wait on the Lord. We are always waiting. You wait to fall asleep at night. You wait for emails to be answered, Amazon packages to arrive, your paycheck to arrive in our bank account, individuals we're sharing Christ with to react to the gospel, and so on. We wait for the Lord to deliver, save, avenge, answer our prayers, provide for our necessities, refresh our strength, display His glory, and do what only God can accomplish. Waiting is only feasible within the confines of time. God, the creator of time, is unaffected by the passage of time. He has already acted while we are waiting for Him to act. God is patient with us, and He knows how to wait. His notion of time is very different from ours, yet His timing is flawless. This is illustrated by this verse, 2 Peter 3, 8-9. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you. Despite the reality of God's Word and the numerous professions of God's immense grandeur and strength that pour forth to acclaim Him from the skies above and the mountains below, mankind has chosen to dethrone God and enthrone King Self, disconnecting their lifeline to their sole way of escape. If He delays, there is a reason. And any delay oozes a supplementary flow of kindness into a Christ-rejecting, wicked world, allowing sinners to turn to Christ for salvation, allowing the prodigal son to return to the Father's grasp, allowing the saint to grow in grace and knowledge of his lovely Lord Jesus. Isn't this wonderful? Take a moment to think about it. He is a God of second chances. Every day that passes is another demonstration of God's long-suffering kindness towards humanity's children. May you avoid getting carried up in a mindset that blames God for inaction and instead focuses on His incredible grace for every one of us. May you come to the unshakable realization that our times are in His hands and that you shall one day walk into His eternal presence at His allotted moment and in His appointed method when faith will fade into sight and hope will be emptied in joy. God does not take long to fulfill His promises to us, and any perceived lag in man's perception cannot invalidate God's flawless, unfolding plan. He will respond when He's ready, which will be soon. It's time for you to wait on God until He answers. The story of Lazarus, a companion of Jesus, is recorded in John 11. When Lazarus became gravely ill, his sisters, Mary and Martha, informed Jesus. Instead of rushing to assist, Jesus purposefully delayed his arrival. Lazarus then died. Lazarus had been dead for four days by the time Jesus arrived. This was done on purpose. Lazarus was supposed to be raised from the dead according to Jesus' plan. Before Lazarus showed any signs, Jesus knew that he would get ill. Before each of us was born, God documented every day that He planned for us. Jesus had a plan before Mary and Martha sent for Him, and that plan included making them wait. This same God who calls the galaxies by their names is unfazed by our predicament. He is aware of the situation. He's always known, and it's part of His plan for us to wait. Waiting on God is beneficial to us. We would be in charge, not God if He acted promptly every time we shouted out to Him. We'd make the decisions, and we don't have His knowledge. We learn to trust Him and His timing as a result of having to wait. How well do you rely on God? Don't sit in the waiting room for too long. While you wait, ask God to empower you and generate persistence, character, and hope in you. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and courageous in your waiting. Those who wait will be rewarded, and His timing is impeccable. He's aware of the situation. He's always known, and it's a part of His plan for us to wait. Your heart's wishes sometimes take time to manifest. They don't appear out of nowhere. When God appears to be the most silent, He is usually at work. Despite the fact that Daniel had to wait three weeks for his request to be answered, God had truly answered it in the same day He prayed. Don't assume that because God doesn't disclose His response right away, He hasn't answered it or that He hasn't answered it yet. 
it's time for you to wait on God until he answers. Just like Daniel, your appointed time of favor has come. Psalms 23 reads this way. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Psalms by David of old is one of the most popular Psalms of all time found in the Bible. Almost everyone reads it at least once in their lifetime, both Christians or non-Christians alike. It is a unique Psalm because it says many things in one message and has many messages in one song. Within the single Psalm is a praise, a prayer, and a declaration of faith. Within the Psalm is a message of faith, a message of hope, a message preparation for trying times all in one. It's such an amazing confirmation of David's depth in his walk with God. And we are so blessed to have such treasure passed down to us today. Dear friend, there is a part of this Psalm that I would walk you through today. It's the part where David says these words, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. We could stay all day talking about the psalm and will never fully comprehend its message. Why? Because the knowledge and workings of God are beyond our complete comprehension. We were not created to fully understand, but to fully trust as we grow in understanding. Romans chapter 11, verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out if we commit ourselves to understand everything, we will later find out that it's a path that has no end with our lifetime. It is a pathway that will reveal our limitations as human beings. However, if you do commit to understand the things God chooses to show you in faith of his goodness, you will find out that it is a path of peace, a pathway that shows the blessedness of being loved by God the Almighty, the Good Shepherd, there are shepherds and there are good shepherds. God is not just the deity who calls humanity to his service, but a God who loves his children and watches over them closely, providing everything that they need. In giving his life for us through the person of Jesus, we see the highest expression of God's goodness. John chapter 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. When David called the Lord his shepherd, he meant in every sense of the word and even much more. One great theme of our opening Psalm, Psalm 23 is goodness of God. The goodness of God is not limited to the manifestation of good things in your life alone. His goodness is the outcome of his own nature, the nature of good. When the Bible says that God is good, many times we only think about his works this is true, but it is not complete. Why do you think it becomes difficult to still declare God's goodness when you can't see it in your life? Why do you find yourself struggling to understand the word then? It's because your mind has been taught to attach God is good to God as a God that does good things, great things that you like in your life. However, my friend, beyond all his works or his intentions, God's goodness is more than the things he does. God's goodness is who he is. It's something he can't stop doing. It's his nature. He can't help but be good. That's why even people who curse him or take his mercy for granted think that they're getting away with such destructive choices because it seems nothing changes in the natural for them. The sun doesn't stop shining on them. The rain doesn't exempt them from its cool showers. Their crops may also receive water like every other person. When Jesus said we should be like our Father in heaven, this was what he was trying to tell us. 
the Father, our shepherd, like David said in Psalm 23, is good by nature. He is the definition of good. Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Can you say this with me? God is good. He is a good God. He is the definition of good, the definition of goodness. There is no good outside him and no bad within him. Even when I don't understand what he's doing, even when I cry in pain or bend over under the weight of crises in my life, I know that God is good. A table prepared before your enemies. In a few chapters later, in Psalm 121, verse 3, we will read these words. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. If I ask you, dear friend, at this moment, where would you like to have your greatest win displayed? Before whom would you like to rejoice and be applauded for your victories? Before whom would you like God to lift you up? You may likely say your family, your friends, people who will better appreciate your wins more. However, it doesn't work that way with God all the time. You see, God will let your family see you and share in your testimonies, but His plan includes the display of your victory and rest before the same elements that work tirelessly to see you fail. What does a table mean to you? To understand this, let's view God as a shepherd to his sheep. In this case, you. A good shepherd is expected to both watch over the sheep and to provide everything that the sheep needs to survive and stay healthy. Water, food, and protection are his chief priorities for the sheep. While the shepherd leads the sheep, they do not settle on grounds that haven't been fully checked yet. He has to quickly move ahead, check the water source, the grasses, the proximity to any form of danger to the sheep, like cliffs or rocky edges, thieves, wild animals, and so on. The sheep may wonder why the shepherd is so busy putting a lot of things in place and not allowing them to go on a feeding spree. They may wonder why it seems this man leading them just walks ahead without shouting out instructions like he is prone to do. They may wonder why he even goes silent while they stand there hungry and tired, not knowing the next course of action. Yet, they trust the shepherd and they wait. You see, because they know the shepherd, they know he loves them. They know every action is for their benefit. So they wait for when he's done. When he's done putting everything in place, the shepherd will then allow them to settle down within a designated area. In that area, the shepherd can easily keep watch. From that area, he can see and also easily fend off any attack of his sheep. And listen to this. As long as the shepherd is actively awake and watching over the flock, no intruder will dare to attack them. Even wild animals who feed on sheep would stand afar off observing for an opening to pounce on them when the shepherd isn't looking. Although a man may slumber or turn his back, creating an opening for sheep to wander or get snatched by a wild animal. God is not a man. God never sleeps. He never slumbers. He is always watching over you. God has a plan, just like that shepherd over your life. It is a plan to give you settlement, a plan to give you a future and a hope, a plan to make your life a means of blessing and inspiration to others. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Like those sheep, your life is surrounded by predators, thieves, enemies, both as people and as dark forces. Some of them have pledged themselves over to Satan to do everything within their power to make life difficult for you, to hurt you, to see you fail, to mock you, to see you amount to nothing in life. Some of them may even be in your life as friends or even as family. They are close, but don't be deceived. They are not for you. Look, this isn't to scare you and make you suspicious of everyone around you. It's actually not your responsibility to point out those who are for you or those who aren't one by one. It's God's responsibility to watch over you and deliver you. 
And one of the ways God will exert his authority and victory over those who have made themselves enemies in your life is not to take their lives. No. Many times we let our emotions guide us and we pray that our enemies die. That's not God's will, my friend. It may seem like your problems will reduce if they die, but that's not true. God is wiser than that. He is stronger and more strategic than that. Your true enemy is Satan, and he uses men and other forces to work against you. That annoying boss, that bully, that jealous colleague or neighbor, that envious friend or sibling. It is the spirit of Satan that's turned them against you. Those people who told you that you would never amount to anything, that's the spirit of the devil working through them to demoralize you. Those who use your past to keep you down, that's the devil. Even if they die today, the spirit is going to look for the next available soul to operate through. Hence God's goodness shows his greatest plan. That as he brings peace into your life eventually, blesses you with that loving spouse, gives you a baby, opens up that contract and all at his own time. He will do so in the very presence of those humans and spirits alike who committed themselves to see you otherwise. He would make them so powerless that they cannot lift up a finger to stop his blessing or workings in your life, but still be very much alive to witness it. Do you realize that he did this with his son, Jesus on the cross and at his resurrection the resurrection of Jesus was the greatest display of God's might. All hell beheld it, but couldn't stop it. Men were stationed there to stop it, but they couldn't. No man or spirit could stop it. The resurrection of Christ is proof of power over death. It is God's proof to you that all hope is not lost. It is God's declaration to you that all who truly believe in him will not be put to shame. What is that thing you are afraid, worried, or ashamed of? In spite of it, God will still settle you because you're his child through your faith in Jesus. Because you chose to believe in the greatest display of his power in heaven, on earth, and even before all devils, God is going to bless you the same way he raised his son Jesus in the presence of your enemy. Keep believing, keep trusting, keep reminding yourself of this truth. Keep going. God is all about to do the unexpected in your life. Hallelujah. How does it feel like when God is speaking to you? Does he really still speak to people today? What are the technicalities involved? How does it really feel? Maybe you have asked yourself these questions one time or another before. In a world where there is so much noise and chaos, in a world where we seem to drown in the pressure of our needs, the pressure of opinions, the pressure of sin, the pressure of opposition, there has risen a greater need to hear the voice of our master. Never has there been a time in history where there is a great need for God to speak as it is this day. As a world, there is a need to hear God speak. As a nation, there is a need to hear the voice of God. As a people, there is a need to hear that almighty voice. As a church, there is a need to hear that voice. As families, as individuals, we are in great need of the voice of God today. There is so much decadence today and so much need for God's instruction to each of us to correct us and set us on track. Someone may say, what's so special about God speaking? Has it made anyone better? We do not need him. We do not need any voice anywhere. I am okay in my own little space. Oh, but those who have a relationship with God know that there is something special about the voice of God spoken over you. David talking about the voice of God declares in Psalms 29, three through nine, the voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon leap like a calf. Syrian, like a young wild ox. 
The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the desert of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all cry, glory. Permit me to say that the voice of God is more than mere utterance. It's not just someone opening their mouth to speak because they have something to say. No, the voice of God ushers in the will of God. It declares and enforces it. Are you getting what I'm talking about? When God speaks, his voice introduces his purpose to us. We see the mind of God in the voice of his words. The power of God rides upon his voice when he speaks. I assure you, no one, nothing can stand against that voice. Seeing that you cannot separate God from his words and seeing that his words are carried by his voice, he is his voice and his voice is him. John 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made, without Him nothing was made that has been made. What God speaks to and over you, everything He wants happens. Everything that needs to live will live. Everything that needs to walk will walk. Everything that needs to die will die. Everything that needs to change will change. Unless God says so, nothing remains the same after he speaks. When does the word of God come? When is it important for God to speak? Let me ask you, how does a learner feel when they have their driving guide beside them telling them what to do? How does a player feel when he or she hears the voice of her beloved coach? How does a child feel when they hear the voice of their parent? There is that feeling of companionship that comes from hearing God speak to you and over you. You feel you're not alone. Isaiah 41, 13. For I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. Think company, think confidence, think hope. That's what comes on you when you hear that sweet voice over you. When God speaks, his power accompanies it. That's why he never speaks when there is no need for it. God speaks because his words carry his backing. He does not just throw his weight around by uttering just about anything. Psalms 33, nine, for he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. Once upon a time, the earth like it is today was in total chaos. It was in shambles and everything was out of order. Everything was covered with darkness and with water. The Spirit of God, the symbol of His presence, moved over the whole situation. He was aware of the crises. He had ascertained its cause, its effect and its extent, and now He was going to do something about it. The Bible does not tell us that God began to complain. Oh no, He didn't start talking about the crises at hand. What happened next? The Bible says, then God said, he spoke, and at once there was. What are you going through right now? Can you relate with the situation the earth was once in? Maybe it seems that your life is at a standstill. Maybe you're under the pressure of a deadline and you have no idea, no resources and no form of help for what to do. Maybe you're at the point right now where it seems even your life is on the clock, like even the life you have right now is going to get snatched away from you. Maybe you just feel stranded right now, alone and afraid, unjustly persecuted, with life's unfairness everywhere you turn. You don't know what to do because every effort has yielded no result. You need to hear God's word over you again. You see, Here's the trick the enemy plays on us many times. He makes you feel like you need to go make God talk. However, you see, God is always speaking either concerning your now or concerning your later. The question is not about whether he is speaking, but whether we are listening. In the midst of your storm, God is speaking. In the midst of your pain, he is speaking. In the midst of confusion, he is speaking. Why? because his word is the guiding light that you need. Do you get it? 
Without it, you will go nowhere. You will stumble here and there. You will struggle. Psalms 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. It's one thing to hear. It's another to know and understand, to really listen to what is being said. Young Samuel had been hearing a lot about the Lord as he was growing in his priestly services in the house of God under Eli the priest. He was growing in his love and understanding of the Most High, and he didn't know what Jehovah sounded like or how to hear him. Then one night, Jehovah called out to the young boy Samuel. Three times he called his name and three times Samuel thought it was Eli calling him until Eli understood and told him, listen, when next he calls you, answer him and say, speak Lord, for your servant is listening. Samuel did this and the Lord spoke to him. That day marked a turning point in the life and ministry of the young prophet. From that day, he would become the go-to of the entire nation for the visions and purposes of God. 1 Samuel 3, 19 through 21. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up and let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. Remember that this was a time in Israel when there was no open visions and the word was rare. Yet when God spoke to and through a young man, he became a trailblazer for the people of God. That's something that happens when God's word comes to you. Besides bringing comfort, direction, confidence, hope and power into your life, his voice in you and through you makes you a light to those around you. The great and mighty man Elijah, once on the run from the wicked queen Jezebel, when the Lord directed him to the mountain of God Horeb, this is a story I want you to learn something from about the voice of God and how you can take advantage of it. When Elijah got there, the Bible says the following, 1 Kings 19, 11 through 13. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Yes, there's a storm going on in your life. Yes. Everything is in chaos right now and you don't know what you have to do. Yet, in order to listen, you have to silence the noise. You can't control the noise around you, but you can do something about the sound you want to listen to. Sometimes you have to separate from some people. Sometimes you have to stop whatever it is that you are doing and then listen. You're not going to hear God by dancing to the tone of the chaos. No, no, my friend. That's what the enemy wants. Sometimes you need to stand down, stop the fight and go still. Take time off from everything else. Shut off the television and stop feeding on the chaos in the news media. Turn off the radio, filling your mind with the food of this world. Shut off those friends and relatives that talk only about fear. Take time away from it all and shut yourself up alone with God. Spend time with your Bible. Spend time in prayers. Spend time in meditation. Carry out the spiritual retreat, that spiritual house cleaning. It's long overdue. It's time to go still, my dear one. You see, in your stillness, you draw closer to God. In your stillness, everything else fades in comparison to Him. In your stillness, your eyes focus on Him. In your stillness, the mountain before you becomes smaller and the God you believe in becomes greater. This is not because God was never greater, but because your attention was on your problem. You drew closer to it than to God, and thus made it mightier than God himself. Whoever refuses to listen to God does at their own peril. He wants us saved, so he makes his word available to us so that we can be made right with him. Even if the whole world will not listen, don't be among them. Make up your mind to be part of those listening in the midst of the noise today. Tell the enemy, 
Satan, I change my mind. I'm not going to dance to your tone no more. You want me to fret? You want me to run all over the place? You want me depressed by placing all my focus on what my problem is saying? But no more. Now, I'm shutting it all down. I'm facing my God. I will listen no more to your lies. I will listen on to what God has to say. For when my God's word comes into me and takes over, then I'm coming back stronger and better. Be still and listen. You will hear him and you will see his power at work.